Hello, my name is Talib Kucukcan. I welcome all of you to the uh, Digital Debates by the TRT World Forum. Uh, today we are going to look at uh, Afghanistan and the uh, peace process that the Afghan people has been longing for for many decades since the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, the people of Afghanistan has have gone through really difficult times. And now I think there is some hope that uh, peace will be established. Today we are going to look at different aspects of this process with excellent speakers uh, from different parts of the world. Let me uh, welcome all of you to the debate and introduce one by one so that uh, our audience will have some idea about who are the uh, speakers today. Uh, I'll begin with uh, Fawzia uh, Kofi. She is a member of the Afghan parliament. She is an accomplished author and internationally known outspoken advocate for the rights of women and children, democracy and moderate Islam in Afghanistan. She had uh, a number of uh, duties, uh, but one of the, I think, major uh, uh, initiatives that she has taken was the founding of Make a Change process. I think we have uh, uh, been watching this for a long time. That's a fundraising project for the orphan female teenagers that uh, she is sponsoring for school. These are the most disadvantaged group in, in Afghanistan. Professor Thomas Johnson, you are also welcome to join us today. Uh, Professor Johnson is a research professor and the faculty member of the National Security Affairs Department at the Naval Postgraduate School, as well as the director of the Program for Culture and Conflict Studies. And she has been, he has been doing a lot of work on Afghanistan for decades, actually. And he was a senior uh, political advisor in 2008 and 2009 uh, to the uh, commander uh, of the Canadian Afghan Task Force station in Kandahar, Afghanistan. And lastly, uh, Professor Barakat, uh, welcome to join us uh, as well. Uh, Professor Barakat is the founding director of the Center for Conflict and Humanitarian Studies and the professor in politics and post-war recovery studies at the University of York. Previously, he served as the director of research at the Brookings Institute Doha Center. He has also a long experience, professional experience in dealing with the conflict management and conflict studies and peace issues. He has led major evaluations and programming initiatives in Afghanistan, Bosnia Herzegovina, Croatia, and many other places. Now, let me begin with uh, uh, Fawzia. Um, uh, as I said in the beginning, Afghanistan and people in Afghanistan has been longing for peace and now uh, some negotiations are taking place. Uh, in your uh, opinion, what are the greatest priorities and challenges facing the upcoming intra-Afghan negotiations? Well, thank you. Um, uh, the, the, the biggest priority for us is to put an end to this four decades of war and bloodshed. And to agree on a political settlement that uh, the Taliban, alongside with the political community of Afghanistan, uh, that include uh, women, that include uh, ethnic and religious diversities of Afghanistan, see themselves. Uh, the priority for us is to agree that it's okay to have different political views, but you can live with different political views. Having different political views and differences of ideology is not enough reason to kill a human being. So that is our priority. Our priority is to um, agree to have a disagreement, but in the meantime, live in a country like Afghanistan, because we have paid not only uh, thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of lives in this four decades of war, but opportunities of a, uh, a better Afghanistan uh, was taken away from us. Uh, opportunities where Afghanistan could use its uh, political and economical uh, resources for improvement of life for its people was taken away from us. So we are hoping that uh, uh, as we move forward, uh, we will be able to achieve a political settlement acceptable by all parties in Afghanistan. Well, thank you very much. But what are the main challenges that you face? You've outlined the priorities, but there are some, I think, challenges uh, facing uh, people of Afghanistan. 
Um, I think the major challenge is because this is a very complex war. Um, the, 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 this war has a lot of dimensions, multi-dimensions. Uh, the regional aspect of this war, the international aspect of this war has made it very complex. And I think um, uh, the challenge right now is that uh, when uh, the United States signed uh, an agreement with Taliban two, uh, a year back, and negotiated with them in the past two years, they did not include the republic side. They did not include the setting government and the political community of Afghanistan. So basically, that gave us Taliban a sense of when they will either win politically or militarily. Now, to negotiate with a group that already is in a in a feeling of win um, in in either way. It's not an easy job. We have to really negotiate things that they have signed with the United States, and we are not a signatory to it. Um, I think the challenge is that we have to really convince the other side that they have to live with the transformed Afghanistan. And of course, there are regional challenges as well. Um, uh, peace is not something that, uh, that many countries in the region uh, will um, see their interest in Afghanistan, while we hope they will eventually, because this is in the regional interest, this is in the interest of our immediate and far neighbors to have a peaceful Afghanistan, because Afghanistan at the end of the day is connecting Central and South Asia. It can be a political hub between the two, um, uh, basically uh, a part of the, the, the Asian countries. And this is in the interest of the region and in the interest of our neighboring countries to, to use this potential of Afghanistan in a stable and peaceful Afghanistan. So therefore, at this stage, we know that it has uh, that the, the, the required consensus, um, regional consensus, is not there to uh, make this process um, uh, to land where we want it to land. Uh, but in the meantime, we are happy that different countries are taking bold steps um, to support this process. Well, thank you for this, I think, uh, initial uh, observations about the uh, priorities and the challenges. Now, let me move on to uh, Professor Barakat. Professor Barakat, what key markers, in your opinion, would indicate a successful and a sustainable outcome in these intra-Afghan peace talks, given the challenges uh, described by uh, Fawzia? Well, the first uh, and most important indicator, I think, is that they are now talking to each other and talking face to face around the table in Doha. This was in itself uh, an achievement given the positions they started from. We have to keep in mind, as uh, Sister Fawzia explained, this is a very complex conflict and it's been going on for 40 years or so. And it took a long and a lot of effort to bring people face to face. One of the major obstacles was that the Taliban movement did not recognize the government and refused to sit with the government. And maybe this is what one of the reasons what drove the United States to do its bilateral direct relation, you know, uh, agreement with the Taliban first. And within that, to wrap in the condition that for it to progress, the Taliban must start talking to the government. Now, their, their official position probably remains that they don't recognize the government and they're often critical of it and so on. But the reality is that they are now talking to a group that uh, represents the government, but other sides as well, political sides uh, included in this uh, uh, negotiation group. And uh, they have uh, been uh, talking since September. It's not fantastic, the speed of progress. And a lot of critics will look at it and say, well, why are we spending so much time and so on? But I think every single uh, day, every opportunity for people to get to know each other does count. And it is important that uh, uh, this uh, uh, direct negotiation is now taking place. I think you have uh, a cautious optimism as far as the, uh, I think, forthcoming uh, intra talks uh, are concerned. Is that right? Well, I am optimistic, but then I'm not in the frying pan. You know, I don't have I don't have the same constraints and, and worries as my brothers and sisters have in Afghanistan. But I think, given where where the situation was a year ago and where we are now, there is a, a cause for optimism, but we should not be complacent. I think there is a need for much more uh, support to the process from uh, neighboring countries to start with. Uh, Sister Fawzia referred to how critical those are and uh, 
you know, in particular, I would say Pakistan is absolutely uh, pivotal in, in reaching a peace in Afghanistan. And uh, the international community, yesterday and today, they met in, in, uh, in a conference in support of Afghanistan. There were more than 50 nations cheering uh, Afghanistan and supporting it and so on. But when it comes to action, very few are, 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 are present. And I think those nations must all be acting as one and placing the pressure where it is where it should be all right uh, professor johnson you have been following events and developments in afghanistan for decades and you've been involved in some projects uh, in the field as well so you've got a lot of experience but i would like to ask you u.s approach to the uh, issue uh, as we quickly move uh, through the first hundred days of uh, biden's presidency what do the president's initial moves with regards to the foreign policy tell us about the possible approaches to the intra-Afghan talks? Well, <clears throat> before I answer that question, let me spend a few minutes and tell you what's been going on for the last two years. And I want to be very firm with this notion that I've worked almost my entire professional life for peace in Afghanistan because I love Afghanistan and I love the Afghan people. But let's remember that Kalalazad started his private meetings with the Taliban uh, in October 2018. And then on February 29th of last year, of 2020, he announced this, quote, historic peace agreement. It was anything but a peace agreement. It was basically a plan for a phased withdrawal of U.S. troops. So, you know, and, and, and let me go on from there. There was no Afghan regime participation, although they said there would be intra-Afghan talks that were going to start within three months. They started within six months. They started on October 20th uh, of last year. It took two months to come up with an agreement and, a, and, and an agenda for the talks. It was completely political theater. Um, you, you know, there's never been a successful peace negotiation in any conflict the size that we see in Afghanistan without an immediate ceasefire. In fact, peace agreements without a, a ceasefire is an oxymoron. And uh, Doha, in my mind, has been completely political theater. I mean, I mean, after they came to an agreement after two months of what the agenda was going to be, the Taliban, as you know, then left for, you know, almost a month to discuss things amongst themselves. Um, we, we, we see nothing important come out of Doha. And the thing that I want you to recognize is before Doha, the Taliban said there's two non-negotiable demands. One is we want the reestablishment of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. And the second, we want the reestablishment of their radical Diobandi Sharia law. Either of those will destroy the Kabul regime. Um, Kabul, uh, Biden recently has suggested that he's not going to be able to get, on May, uh, get out in May 1, but he, will, he can't see Afghan troops being there um, next year. I think this, and I know this is very pessimistic for people, this is Vietnam all over again. Um, the Taliban are not going to share a government with Ghani. They stated that. Ghani has stated he's not going to share a government with the Taliban. Ghani's not viewed as a legitimate president by the vast majority of the Afghan people. And it's just a perfect storm for the Taliban to take over the country. Um, you know, they, they have, it's estimated now they have 65,000 people in country. Um, I've analyzed deeply the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces, and it's going to be just like in Vietnam. Um, once the international forces, and, and Ghani has admitted this, uh, uh, once the international forces leave, they're going to go into the woodworks. Let's remember, you know, William Malley, who is a great diplomatic historian and a great scholar of Afghanistan, has suggested that this agreement, and I put it in quotations, between the Taliban and the United States is the worst international agreement since Munich in 1938, which we all know was an appeasement uh, uh, treaty, or, Viet, or the Paris Peace Talks in Vietnam in, in 1973. So I, I think Vietnam all over again. I am very, very pessimistic for the future of Afghanistan, at least the future that we presently see. 
Well, thank you very much. I think we will come to the U.S. policy a little bit later with you. But now I just would like to turn to uh, Fauzi again, because Biden seems to be a little bit hesitant about withdrawing the U.S. troops from Afghanistan. Timetable might change. Uh, how do you uh, see this uh, and U.S. policy uh, towards Afghanistan, especially whether there's a change in Biden's administration towards the presence of uh, U.S. troops uh, in, yeah. in your country? Yeah, please, let me respond to that. I mean, you have yeah, can, to... Can, can, uh, Professor Johnson, can we come back to you a little bit later? Because okay, this sure. question was addressed to uh, Fawzi, but uh, I'll come back to you uh, on the U.S. position. Yeah. Can you turn on your... Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Sure. Um, well, we understand that uh, Taliban as a military extremist group are one reality of Afghanistan, but they are not the all uh, only or all the realities of Afghanistan. There are other political groups. There are, uh, you know, the transformed Afghanistan. And one has to look at the, um, you know, the bigger picture of the national security in Afghanistan and in the United States. While we, we still don't know what is going to be the, um, the foreign policy of, uh, of President Biden when it comes to uh, troops withdrawal uh, exactly. And uh, while we still don't know how are they going to deal with um, this peace process and peace agreement they have signed, we know that uh, first May um, uh, agreed in uh, Doha agreement between Taliban and the United States is not practical anymore because the, the, the more we get closer to 1st May, um, the more logistically it becomes difficult. Um, and I think the expectations were, as uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the previous speaker said, the expectations were that the ne negotiation, the inter afghan negotiation started in September in Doha, will pave the way for a political agreement uh, or a power sharing agreement, not only uh, at the political level, but also at different layers of society, a social peace, so to say, um, that paved the way for um, withdrawal of troops. Um, I think uh, as long as there is war, there are legitimate concerns that um, uh, withdrawal uh, based on deadlines, but not based on the conditions, will pave the way for uh, you know, deteriorating security situation in Afghanistan. Uh, one has to be realistic. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, if uh, either side of the negotiation, in this case, uh, the Taliban and the, the Islamic Republic, the more they start to like, um, do not focus on agreeing on a political settlement, and is there, there is war, they gave reason for international community presence in Afghanistan. Um, uh, the war is the reason for international community presence in Afghanistan. So I, I think if, if the Taliban would like the troops withdrawal, or uh, the foreign troops withdrawal, they really have to agree on a ceasefire. They have to, uh, both sides need to agree on a political settlement so that uh, there is no reason for international community to be in Afghanistan. My concern living in the last 30, uh, all, of, all my life in Afghanistan, except the past six months that I spent mostly in Doha negotiating with Taliban. Uh, as somebody who lived all my life in Afghanistan, I know that from not very far history, only 20, 25 years back, when the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan and without a political, a total political settlement, a sustainable political settlement, actually, without international guarantors, we know that uh, it, it resulted collapse of institutions as a result of which the civil war and then emerge of uh, Taliban occurred. So therefore, in order to avoid um, 20 years back history, um, uh, we need to make sure that the withdrawal is condition-based rather than deadline-based. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, all speakers talk about moving forward, but I think given the complexities of the past and its implications for the present, we have a very complex issue. And uh, Professor Barakat was uh, shaking his head when uh, Professor Johnson was talking. I wonder whether you share his uh, pessimism because he seems to be very pessimistic. Uh, and also you can maybe add a little bit on the observation regarding the role of the international community and probably the uh, salient uh, actors that should be focused on when it comes to the uh, peace negotiations? Well, obviously, with all due respect to Professor Johnson, I, I disagree on the fact that this has been a rushed process. Attempting to talk to the Taliban has started in 2009. This has been going on for years. The office in Doha was opened in 2013. There has been consistent effort to try and bring 
a political settlement and to this conflict out of a very clear recognition that there is no military solution for this. The United States, a superpower with all its might, NATO, you name it, they've thrown everything at Afghanistan. They have not been able to end, bring an end to this conflict. There is only one way forward, and that is negotiated settlement between the parties. Now, this has been going, this effort has been going for a long time. It is true that since 2018, and with the blessing of Trump, in fact, 2016, Trump has accelerated out of all concerns of his own. But we, we, have, we have nothing to do with the internal politics of the United States, and we're not really interested in that. What we're interested in is how can all of those interests be used best for Afghanistan? Afghanistan needs a break. It needs the war to stop. And you have to start somewhere. So it may not have been perfect, and there is no agreement between any party that is perfect. It's a compromise to reach the agreement. And I probably agree with Mali that it wasn't, it's uh, anyway, we, no one calls it a peace agreement, except I think maybe for the Taliban. But if you look at the title itself, it's not a peace agreement between the United States and, and Taliban. And it gives a specific condition and it, it, it introduces four pillars that must be taken into consideration. One of them is the negotiation that is taking place in Doha at the moment. A fourth pillar, where they need to move on as a result of these talks is about the ceasefire, a comprehensive ceasefire uh, to, uh, to start. Now, I think in going back, if you allow me to the US policy, uh, from the way, uh, from where I sit and how I see it, they went into, uh, uh, into a state of uh, sleep, you know, there's not, no, nothing, no, nothing was heard from the US throughout the elections and then waiting for Biden to come be elected. And until now, people are still waiting for a US policy. Then suddenly we had the leaked letter and the proposal to move and to start uh, talks in, in Turkey. Now, uh, that is not real planning out of interest for Afghanistan. That is still responding to local pressure, local politics in the United States and expecting Afghanistan to dance to its music. And I think that is in itself is a real, real problematic. Now, uh, this recent announcement, uh, it has made few things clear. One of them is that the government of Afghanistan that was trying to prolong and delay the process in the hope that Biden gets elected and the Democrats will bring a different approach. I think they were disappointed because the approach, the letter, the tone, the fact that he's still talking about withdrawal, the fact that he's still committed to the agreement, all of this was not really uh, uh, expected. People were hoping, at least one side was hoping that something very different would come. That thing did not come. What did come, I think, is an added layer of confusion at the moment. But again, in an optimistic way, we look at this confusion as an opportunity to have injected energy in the process. Ever since the letter was leaked, People have been meeting almost daily in, in, in Doha. Uh, they have started to focus their mind on the issue. They started to see the, the real threat of internationalizing this issue, the real threat of having regional solution rather than Afghan-led solutions, and the fact that the United States has already made up its mind. Whether they're going to withdraw now or in six months' time, uh, it doesn't really matter. What really matters is that the Afghans have got to get their head around the fact that the United States has finished. It's no longer, they don't, they don't want it to become a Vietnam. It's for them, it's, it's over. And I think the sooner all Afghans agree on this, the better, I will go back to what Sister Posia said, if there are no troops, then the reason for Taliban to fight is no longer there. And I think the whole idea that they want to come and reestablish the state and so on, uh, uh, we never heard it from uh, any of their uh, people saying that we are fighting to re-establish the Emirates. Since they've joined the talks, I think all countries made it very clear that uh, the Emirates will not be uh, recognized and will not be accepted, including in, uh, the Qataris and uh, Pakistan and all neighboring countries to Afghanistan have again and again emphasized that the Emirate is not an option. Coming back to you, uh, Professor uh, Johnson. Uh, so you've got some disagreements with uh, Professor Barakat, of course, that is uh, quite normal. But uh, what is your view about the US 
policy, possible approaches to the upcoming uh, issues. This is one side of the uh, uh, question. The second side of the question is uh, the regional actors, India and Pakistan, to what extent they can be uh, influential and they can exert uh, actually uh, some influence on both parties to move forward. Uh, I think we can maybe look at these three major players, uh, US plus Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, sorry, India. Yeah, well, let me uh, suggest one thing uh, to the professor. They've stated on numerous occasions before Doha that those two non-negotiable demands that I mentioned are true. Yesterday, one of the lead stories in the New York Times was that the Taliban have declared victory and it's an analysis of that. So I'll just leave it at that. But people in Afghanistan and other scholars never understood what Biden has represented all along. After, after uh, Obama gave his famous West Point speech in December of 2009 that called for a surge of American troops, Biden was the one person in the administration that was totally against this. He's always, he was always against the, uh, the, the utilization of coin because he saw it as nation building. And our military and, and, and a lot of our other institutions have been terrible at, at nation building uh, at nation building over the years. So, you know, Biden has never been a strong, he, he recognizes there's been two generations that have seen nothing but war in Afghanistan. And I'm sure that he's as, as disturbed as I am. And I'm always up for negotiations, but they're political theater. I'd like you to t tell me one thing that's come out of Doha since it started. But the thing about Biden is, you know, he, he stated a couple of days ago that we're not going to be able to meet the May 1 deadlines, but he can't foresee us there next year. And this should not be a surprise to anybody that has studied uh, Biden, because Biden was never for the number of troops that we put in Afghanistan in the first place. He wanted a uh, counter-terrorist uh, 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 strategy in Afghanistan, and that's it. And, you know, he didn't want us operating off of fives to do something, you know, counterinsurgency where you can't do it. You know, you got to be with the actual rural people. You can't do that off of fob. But Biden's let his let his uh, um, positions known for at least eight years. So um, I think the agreement, which is not agreement at all, is terrible. And I haven't seen one useful thing coming out of Doha. So while I think negotiations are always good, you've got to negotiate with a, with a group that wants the negotiation. The Taliban will fight for 50 years to be able to achieve. They're war weary too, but a lot of that is political theater. And if you don't believe that, you're kidding yourself. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll stick with my original premise. I think Kalal Azad treated uh, um, Afghanistan almost a, as a U.S. colony making all of these agreements with the Taliban. I mean, seven to 5,000 of, of, of some of the fierce, fiercest uh, Taliban commanders, uh, you know, being let out of jail without Kabul even knowing that was an agreement that he made without any, uh, you know, impact uh, from, from the, from the uh, Kabul regime, as well as other things in that absolutely absurd uh, February 29th, quote, peace agreement. So, you know, I, I don't, I'm not happy to say what I'm happy, uh, what I'm saying at all. I'm very distressed, but it's realistic. If you think that Ghani is going to form a coalition government with the Taliban, you're delusional. And if you think the Taliban are going to form a coalition government with Ghani, you're delusional. And that's my position. Uh, Biden's known, again, if you would study Biden, you would have known what his position was 10 years ago. And it's always been a very small U.S. footprint and only dealing with counterterrorism. And, you know, and, and he's a, I thought that he was going to turn down the, the Kalal Azad Trump agreement in the yes. first place. That's what I was hoping for. But he's accepting it. And okay. Uh, can I uh, ask Fauzia whether he, she agrees with uh, Professor Johnson? Because uh, Fauzia, you said that you've been in the Doha for the last six months, but it seems that uh, nothing meaningful came out of it. That is the uh, claim by uh, Professor Johnson. Do you agree with him? Or if there are meaningful things are coming out of it, what are they? 
Well, firstly, um, I think there is a, a, a consensus along um, the uh, Muslim world, I would say. Many uh, statements came out from the Muslim world questioning the, log the logic of this war. Um, because since the uh, Taliban and the U.S. signed an agreement, um, the Taliban committed not to kill any foreign troop in Afghanistan, which is a good thing. But they continue to kill their own people, uh, which is something people question. Like, if this is a jihad and holy war um, against the foreign invasion, how come that you sign an agreement with the foreigners uh, and not target them anymore, but you continue to kill your own people? So a lot of Muslim countries, actually, and Muslim scholars start questioning, including uh, Muslim scholars in Doha start uh, issuing statements that the, uh, and questioning the logic of this war. So this war is not a logical war for many people, including Islamic scholars, from day one, uh, especially after the agreement is signed with the United States. Um, now, um, uh, but we also know that, and I stated initially that um, uh, the best would have been the ideal situation when. United States got engaged with um, uh, with Taliban uh, to ag agree on, on, on their issues uh, with Taliban. It was important that uh, from Islamic Republic, and um, here I'm not talking about one individual as uh, uh, Professor uh, Johnson mentioned, but the public, the bigger umbrella of political community of Afghanistan, including the government. It was better if they were in, engaged and consulted in order to respect Afghan, own, and, and Afghan ownership and Afghan leadership. Uh, that is one of the major shortcomings of this process. Now that the, the negotiation started, uh, uh, yes, the ideal situation would have been that if we could agree on issues of substance, but let's remember that this is a, a war with multi-dimensional complexities, with a different, in a, I mean, in a very conflicting region, with different countries having their own interests, unfortunately, using Afghanistan's vulnerability. We have uh, you know, started this uh, negotiation with good faith. Um, and I think there are uh, things that we have achieved in this uh, process. Yes, it was, uh, this was an opportunity to achieve more. Um, uh, but I think all of the international factors, including lack of kind of clarity on um, the U.S. part as well, uh, played its role in not letting enough pressure on both sides to agree politically. Our hope is that um, moving forward, now there are talks about um, uh, about uh, uh, Turkey hosting another conference. Uh, we 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 continue the negotiations here every day or almost you know um, every day, but uh, occasionally also. We do uh, talk with the other side and we have uh, some issues that we have agreed. We have discussed some of the issues of substance. We have not agreed on the issues of substance, like for instance, on how a political settlement would look, would look like, because this is something we uh, probably need a bigger, bigger discussion with participation of, you know, bigger community of political groups from Afghanistan, including from Taliban also. But I think this negotiation paved the way for that. I think this negotiation that we started in September, and can you believe like uh, 20 years back for Taliban to sit across the table with a woman uh, was something probably that will, um, uh, you know, not acceptable. I don't want to give an example, but not acceptable. They would not regard a woman as a equal citizens, uh, equal class citizen of the society. Now, uh, we almost every night uh, until late evening, uh, we discuss the same issues for a common, uh, you know, good, uh, well future for our country, uh, not only about women's rights, but about major issues. Um, I think these are uh, small steps, but with major impact that paved the way for uh, hopefully uh, uh, a political um, uh, settlement that will, uh, that will result a ceasefire for the interests of Afghanistan. From this perspective, I can see some light in the tunnel. As uh, Fawzia said, I think even the uh, uh, presence of a female in the uh, team in the negotiating table is something for the uh, uh, for the Afghanistan people and for the for the I think warring section. 
uh, looking at from a sociological and also uh, maybe a theological perspective, I, I would say. Uh, I think uh, uh, many people would like to see that there is more, I think, progress in that. But uh, also, I think uh, everybody agrees here that there are many challenges, as uh, pointed out by all of you. Now, Professor Barakat, I, I think you have heard all the uh, arguments here that uh, there isn't much of a meaningful outcome of the uh, uh, negotiations so far. Do you think that will be an obstacle for the future? Or do you think that, you know, this... Uh, uh, challenges might be overcome. And if that is going to be the case, what sort of um, tools, instruments, and arguments you would see from the uh, Taliban and from the government uh, uh, spokespeople and representatives in the peace talks? As I said at the beginning, I am optimistic. Huh? And I think uh, uh, my experience from, from other contexts is that usually you make much progress in the last 20% of the time of any of these talks. So let's not write it off altogether. Very important things happened in the last few weeks. The American position, although there is no formal policy, has given its colors. And I think the government has actually shifted its position. They are investing more in wanting the talks to succeed. Uh, the sides from, from Kabul are talking with much more serious tone than they did even a few months ago. The same applies to the Taliban. I'm not sure the Taliban are very happy for internationalizing the conflict. I don't think they would want to really want to go to Turkey for many, many reasons, including the fact that Turkey uh, traditionally has been seen on the side of Dostum and uh, recently has also been accused of having supplied him with, with weapons. So there are certain issues there that are, are, have happened and have helped people focus their minds on what opportunity exists at the moment. Now, I think from outside, what we need to do is, is to continue to support them uh, in removing certain obstacles. Uh, regional countries uh, need to have a common understanding of what goes on in Afghanistan beyond just meeting and, and cheering them up and agreeing in general. We all understand the influence Pakistan has uh, and in, in, in the country. Uh, if Pakistan changes its psyche of seeing Afghanistan as a strategic depth vis-a-vis -vis its relationship with, with India, that would help. If Pakistan sees that there could be a balance between the power of Taliban in Afghanistan and, and Pakistani Taliban, that would help. A lot of uh, uh, focus, I think, is needed on that agenda. Now, Turkey, and if I allow, me, allow me to come back to Turkey, could be extremely helpful if it is used strategically and not just in terms of uh, political propaganda and, and uh, just, you know, changing uh, venues or adding to a venue. Turkey, as a Muslim country, has a very important position to play. Uh, it's one of the most uh, or largest contributors to NATO. So it can be seen as a continuation. If there was a delay in the withdrawal, maybe Turkish troops can remain. It can also support in terms of monitoring what is agreed. One of the biggest challenges at the moment is, is to verify whether the Taliban and the Americans are actually living up to the terms of their agreement. Each side, only on daily basis, accuses the other of having preached, preached the, the agreement. There is no one to do this kind of monitoring on the ground. Uh, Turkey, with its strong and growing relationship with Pakistan, I think can provide the required confidence that this is not going to be or it's enough of it being a, a game between India and Pakistan. So uh, there is that, and, and, and I personally am very pleased that Turkey has been brought into this. What disturbs me is that they were, like everybody else, surprised by the announcement of them playing a role. It wasn't really part of an organized, systematic, strategic thinking uh, on how we're going to move forward. Uh, uh, it's a bright idea. Somebody came up with it somewhere, and suddenly it became a policy. And now everybody is focused on what happens next. And Turkey is very different, or the meeting in Turkey is very different from the one that was held recently in Moscow. Moscow, we all know the Troika, they have been set up to help each other, China, Russia, and the United States, and it provides a channel of communication between these three countries that do not agree on a lot of things, and their relationship has been strained already. 
uh, they met in Moscow, they uh, invited Pakistan, they invited the, the two sides, and that was in a few days. Uh, it may have caused a delay, it may not have caused a delay. It has created the new challenges because of the confrontation between some warlords and the Taliban in the room and so on. But nevertheless, it's, it's something that happened and it's good because it shows there's an, an, an interest from the Troika, from China, Russia, and the United States working together. With Turkey, I think we need a clarity as to whether this is a one-off conference or is this a process? And if it's a process, where would it start? Where would it end? Uh, how would it work in relation to the 1st of May deadline? The United States continues to speak about its commitment to the agreement. And, and really, we have to take it to where the Taliban are. You know, those who studied the Taliban at some ranks understand the way they, they operate. Uh, until now, and maybe Sister Fauzia can confirm this, they still refer to the 29th of February agreement as the, the, the ultimate starting point. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult, it's a problem. Now, if you add to, to this another process without really tackling that one obstacle, uh, I'm not sure how we're going to progress uh, any further. They are very clear about what they demand. They want further release of prisoners uh, and, uh, and, and they want the full withdrawal of the United States from Afghanistan by that deadline. Now, without the, these two being addressed before going to, to Turkey, uh, I think it's going to be another, another debate to be open. And most importantly, and I think this is a technical aspect that has been missing in Doha, which probably is a mistake, and a lot of sides agree on it now, is the absence of uh, a mediator in the room. Uh, the Afghan-owned, Afghan-led slogan has been interpreted uh, to mean that you leave the Afghans to sort things on their own. And unfortunately, that has not really worked as efficiently as, as people would like. Uh, and uh, now there, there is a need to think very seriously as to how the next phase uh, can be accelerated by introducing structured facilitation or, or even better, a form of mediation between the two sides. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, Professor Barakat has outlined some of the lessons that should be drawn from the previous uh, maybe talks and negotiations uh, and the challenges ahead as well. Now I'd like to come back to you, uh, Professor Johnson, uh, but my question will be about the role of the NATO because you have been on the ground and you have had some experience uh, with the uh, NATO. Uh, what role do you think uh, NATO can play in the process uh, uh, between the uh, sides in Afghanistan uh, in 2021 and beyond? Uh, let me answer that because it's quite easy. And then I want to address a couple of very great comments that my other panelists have suggested. Uh, NATO will leave as soon as as the United States does. It might be a, a week, it might be a month, but they're leaving. I have students from Germany. I have students from most of the NATO countries, and they all have told me their governments are going to leave as soon as the United States leave. So NATO's not going to be able to play a role. You've got to understand that this is the first time in NATO history that they've operated outside of the European uh, you know, uh, area. And this is gonna be a, a major blow to NATO, but they're not gonna play much of a role. Now I'd like to uh, just address a couple of things. I think very interesting that um, uh, Dr. Barakat uh, rose, uh, raised as well as Ms. Kufi. First of all, I'm well aware, well, first of all, let me tell you this. And I think you've got to keep this in mind that the Taliban of 2000 20 and the Taliban of 2021 are not the Taliban of 1996. They're not the Taliban of 2001. They're not the Taliban of 2010. They're not even the Taliban of 2014. They understand international symbolism, okay, which they never understood before. And that's one thing I want to point out. The second thing is I'm well aware uh, Dr. Barakat, that there's negotiations have been going on for a long time. Let's remember back in, in 2009 when both ISI and CIA, uh, you know, captured uh, Mullah Berater and Mullah Zakat in, 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 in um, uh, Karachi. Um, the Pakistanis left Zakat go outside of Peshawar within six 
I think six or nine days. But Beredo, Beredo, they knew he's a popple's eyes Ronnie. His family knows, knew Karzai quite well. And he was negotiating with, with Karzai. And the Pakistanis were very concerned that there were negotiations going on that they didn't have a part in. So I'm well aware of, of, of uh, long time negotiations. And, and Pakistani's position has changed over the years. Um, uh, as relative to strategic depth, I think it's a meaningless com- uh, 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 a meaningless concept now that Pakistan has tacular nuclear weapons. Uh, they're worried about having enemies on both sides of their border. Strategic depth is no longer a useful concept in my opinion. Um, and I, I just go back to the main point that I've made all along, is that if the Taliban were interested in peace, they would have agreed with a ceasefire. What did they agree on? A reduction in violence? What the heck does that mean? They're going to only kill 100 people versus 150? You know, it's very, you know, if they wanted peace, they would have agreed to a ceasefire. And the last thing I want you all to recognize, and I think that you probably do, I, let me talk a little about the letter that was leaked on, uh, on, on 7 March uh, by U.S. Secretary of State Blanken. He delivered a blunt message that urged President Ghani to agree to, a, a, to be removed. Uh, he, uh, that Ghani to agree to a process that would essentially lead to Ghani's um, removal of power, dissolve his government, and establish a new inclusive administration that would include the Taliban. By contrast, no such existential terms seem to have been delivered to the Taliban, um, who increasingly appear as a government in waiting, in my opinion, despite of uh, what uh, many people believe. Uh, the United States continues, I think, well, I'm not going to get into that. Um, but but that leaked letter said a lot. Um, and um, and that on top of the notion that Biden has never been in favor of a large footprint in Afghanistan should tell everyone a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Johnson. Now, let's let me uh, Mr. Barakat, are you going to say something about that? If you would like to respond, please just uh, go ahead. No, no, at the risk of sounding as if I'm defending Khalil Zad, I think he's done a, a, a very impressive job over, over, the, over the last few years. And uh, you, when you talk about the 29th of February agreement, on the very same day, his people and senior Americans were in Kabul signing a similar agreement with the government of Afghanistan. So it was never really that he was just dealing with one side and not dealing with the other. It's just that he found himself in a position where these two sides would not sit and he had to break the lock somewhere. He had to start the process somewhere. And this is why we, and how we where we where we are now. So uh, it, it, I think I, I agree that um, the, the Taliban may have some Wacky ideas, they still have some uh, ambitions, etc. Uh, but, uh, and they probably have different political views amongst themselves. But they have managed to remain as one united movement. Uh, and that concept was suspected many times and it was tested many times, and they've proven again and again that they are one movement. Three times they called the ceasefire over AIDS and, and other occasions, and they were able to stop fighting across. The country and that i think is a positive aspect for reaching a settlement and it's something that people should really bank on the horrible scenario would be a breakup of the taliban we already know that there is isis in afghanistan that the americans flushed out from the middle east they ended up back in afghanistan and, and they're much stronger and they are now uh, killing they're assassinating a lot of the you know the bombs etc there, no one knows who's behind it, but they could be part of uh, ISIS is very active, but they are enemy to the Taliban. And I think some, somehow the Afghans have got to come together and work out where, where should be the, the, the emphasis at this moment in terms of breaking security. I fully agree with the concept that 
it is uh, it is awful to be able to, to negotiate while the war is going on, uh, and I think it must add a huge pressure on 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 colleagues who are around the table to to be able to sit and, and look in the eye of, of the other, and you know that your people are are being killed. But uh, uh, for that to to stop, I think the Afghans have got to show leadership. And leadership cannot come from outside. Biden's plan, anybody's plan, is not going to work. And if anything, it will just, as I said earlier, mobilize the Afghans and bring them together to find a solution. Well, okay, thank you very much. Uh, Fawzia, we have started with you, and I would like to end with you, actually. Uh, you have played a, a key role uh, as a human rights activist and a representative of the government in the peace talks recently. From human rights perspective, this is one of the, I think, uh, most fundamental issues. What do you hope to see included in future long-term agreements and changes to Afghanistan's political landscape? Well, I guess this um, the success of this peace process depends on how women rights and human rights will be treated. Afghanistan um, is a democracy, a social democracy, not only a structural democracy, but a social diversity. And if there are different political views, that is an indication of a, a pluralistic society that accommodates different views, that live with different views. It is not a one party government and it doesn't, it, it's not meant to be a one ideology government. If there are different political views in Afghanistan, that is an indication of how pluralistic the society is. And I hope, and that's what we try to preserve. Moving forward, the diversity of Afghanistan will be preserved. But let me also mention a few points. First of all, on the moderator, uh, on the, uh, um, the facilitator, we are hoping that there will be a UN engagement or UN-led um, facilitator moving forward in Turkey. Uh, event. Um, we believe that with a multinational organization engagement and their guarantee of the peace process, uh, sustainability of the agreement after uh, it's signed is more ensured. Um, we're also, um, let me also say that uh, since uh, 2001, uh, since the establishment of the new system in Afghanistan, Afghan government and its institution has multiple agreements with the world, strategic and security agreements. Um, uh, and the one that was announced last uh, February is not an agreement. In fact, it's just a press release uh, reassuring the people of Afghanistan that uh, the world will stay with a democratic setting government. And I think that's, a, that's the best approach for the world to uh, choose. We have to clarify what is our definition of uh, a peace deal. If the definition is to surrender Afghanistan to one ideology, that is not going to work. It is not going to end the war in Afghanistan. The, our understanding is that all different groups will come together and agree on a, on a settlement that will bring peace and stability in Afghanistan. So if any country or any individual um, definition of, uh, of the peace um, process in Afghanistan is to uh, you know, uh, one ideology uh, or one political group or one political society or one military extremist group, uh, we surrender the power, that is not going to work. Probably it will bring one uh, uh, part of the society into power, but it's not going to end the war, the war. The important thing here is we have to end the war in a way that, it, that Afghanistan will live in peace with itself and in peace with its neighbors. Well, thank you very much, um, so, Mr. Can I make okay. just one very small point, which I need sure. to make? Sure. Yeah, sure. I just wanted, I should have stated this at the beginning, but I want to make sure that everybody recognizes that my opinions are my opinions. They don't represent the Na Naval Postgraduate School. They don't represent the United States government. They represent me. So don't think that anything I said is official U.S. policy or anything close to it. It's my opinions, and that's I should have I should have given the disclaimer when I started. But thank you very much for letting me have it at the end. Well, no worries, Professor Johnson. I think we've had a very good intellectual debate here, regardless of uh, uh, professional affiliation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ms. Fawzia Kofi, Professor Thomas Johnson, and Professor Sultan Baraka. It was a very interesting talk, and we have really enjoyed it. As TRT World Forum Digital Debates, of course, we will be monitoring and following the peace talks in Turkey as well, and we will come back to you 
with uh, other uh, experts. Uh, maybe we will invite you again here uh, so that we can continue our discussion. Thank you very much. And are from TRT World Forum Digital Debates, we would like to say goodbye to everyone. Goodbye. Thank you very much.